Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the third episode of Inside Justice here on the PIX11 News Facebook page. Bail reform, huge topic that so many of you have been interested in on both sides of the aisle. Some of you saying that you are absolutely for this. Some of you saying it's making for a more dangerous city, right? We talked about this in episode number two with both sides of the aisle. That is one of the main issues we're talking about with Queens uh, District Attorney Melinda Katz today. But just to give you an overview of where we're at in terms of bail reform, let's take a look at what Nicole Johnson reported this week. Eugene Webb is one example of what bail reform critics are talking about. Police arrested Webb for randomly assaulting two women on the same day last week. Hours later, he walked out of Manhattan Criminal Court, released under bail reform. Police arrested Webb again for aggressively panhandling. We taken away the discretion that judges have uh, to consider the danger these folks might be to public safety across the city. NYPD's first deputy, Benjamin Tucker, understands the need for change to the bail system. But just after about two weeks, the new bail reform law took effect. You are putting uh, people who have committed a whole series of, of uh, serious crimes back in the streets. Another example, this man, Gerard Woodbury, arrested for robbing four banks in the city and in Brooklyn. A judge released Woodbury and days later police say he was back at it. These are just some of the concerns and still advocates say the reform is needed. Bail reform was meant to make sure people come back to court. Color of Change, an advocacy group cool released it. Justice oh, Not geez, Fear, man. A campaign yeah, to drive home to this message. Get us to believe that we can somehow jail our way to safety. In a statement, a spokesperson said bail reform is saving lives, and we need Governor Cuomo and New York State's elected leaders to stand firm and not let a few days of scare tactics undo years of progress. So obviously this is an ongoing conversation, right? So many of you have opinions about this. We've talked about it here on Facebook. Let's introduce our guest for today, Queens District Attorney Melinda Katz. And you, this is one of your first months on the job as District Attorney. I think it's day 16. Day 16, there you go, right? Um, thank you for coming in, say, for this uh, third episode here. First, let me get your position on bail reform as a whole. So in general, bail is meant to just have people show back up in court that might not show up otherwise. And so <clears throat> from the advocate's perspective, I totally agree with that. I am not a fan of cash bail. I think that we need to get to a system like New Jersey and like other states in the country where we don't use cash in order to keep people coming back for their court appearance. And this is the problem, right? If you have someone who has committed a crime and the judge sets bail of, let's say, $100,000. Mm -hmm. If the person who committed the crime has money, that person gets out. That person's having dinner with their family that night, and the next day they're walking their children to school. If the person doesn't have money, it doesn't mean that the judge thought they were any less or more dangerous or any more or less ready to show up at court because they still set the same amount of bail. But if they're poor or don't have the infrastructure, that person is sitting in Rikers Island until the trial. And, and that in and of itself has an unfairness about it. And I think the reason we're here today is because the system has gone so far over the last several years to a position where they were just putting bail on everyone. And the inequities of it, and the arrests, the overbail of people of color, um, and, and all of that that went into it, really pushed the system to the other side. <coughs> but what we saw in Nicole's reporting, for example, was that somebody who committed, say, second degree burglary or second degree robbery could be put in jail and awaiting their trial. Now they're being released yeah. and they're committing the same crime again. It's almost like a get out of jail free card. I do think the legislature's got to go back in and figure out some other process by which we can do this. And I'll give you an example. You know, I don't believe in cash bail, but right now I have no other system. Mm -hmm. All right, we don't have our supervised release in place. We don't have anything that uh, keeps track of whether we send individuals out and they stay at home. Uh, for supervised release. We don't have a method by which to put them into cure violence programs, into drug rehab programs, into workforce development. And so what has happened is we're in a position now where bail is one of the only things we have, especially in the more violent crimes. And we shouldn't be in that position. We should be in the position of making a judgment every single time. This person's gonna show back up at court. This person needs mental health services. This person needs drug rehabilitation. And we have those resources available to us. I will admit it has been a little bit interesting to try and figure out the new laws 
with making sure that we keep our boroughs safe under these new laws. I have no doubt that the legislature is going to go back and review it, at least I hope so, and uh, we will figure it out. So you campaigned, obviously, uh, on getting rid of cash bail. Yes. You're admitting yourself that it's take, uh, going to take some time. It's going to take some time. Because, for example, one of the first things was a case for $50,000 bail in Queens. That person was set bail at $2,000. So That's it's right. still happening. And by the way, just for the record, that was in my first like Day. 12 hours right. of being the district attorney. And since then, we've come to uh, look at every single case, case by case, figure out what the best uh, process is and what the best path forward is. But it's going to take some time. But it's also going to take cooperation and collaboration right. with the state, with the city, to figure out these supervised release programs and to make sure that we have them in play. So do you think, like the NYPD, for example, Ben <clears throat> Tucker was there on camera with Nicole Johnson saying that the city could become less safe because of this. It might be too early to tell. Um, but do you think the borough of Queens, for example, could become less safe because of this? And when you say, okay, hand, answer that first. I, I think that there's a balance that has to be reached. I mean, I just saw your uh, clip of the news and mm -hmm. it said the, it showed the advocates talking about lies being ruined by bail. And at the end of the day, that is true also. Uh, people that commit minor crimes, people that are held on bail of $2,000 or $5,000 who simply can't get out because they're poor. Yeah. And that's not fair. That's not the way the system is supposed to work. The system is supposed to work that people show back up at their court date. That's what bail was originally for. But what happens now is we look at the case and we look at the priors and we look at if they've done time before and we try to figure out what type of bail and how much it will be to have them show back mm -hmm. up at court. To get to a cashless system, we need to look at what other states are doing and how they are moving forward. And you know, as I said after a few days, uh, you know, Jersey's still standing with the laws that they have. They're not using cash bail. California is making amendments as they move forward to their new laws and how they are doing cashless bail. But at the end of the day, it's an inequity that has to be f dealt mm -hmm. with. And, and we weren't dealing Does with it. Does it make your job harder? It makes it um, more of a case-by-case -case basis. And by the way, I don't think harder is, is worse. I think that to some extent we were hired to do the hard choices mm -hmm. and to make those hard choices. And just because it is a little more time consuming and a little more effort, I think that's a good thing. Everyone that gets arrested, every victim, every witness, these are all individuals and people with families and p jobs to get mm -hmm. back to. Uh, and it doesn't help anyone for people on minor crimes to be held on bail and they're not going to work and putting food on the table for their children. The assembly is putting their foot down right now saying that this is what they want in place. They don't really want to look at reform. They were up in Albany the other day talking about this. Let's play a little clip of that and then get your reaction. There's a real public safety issue. If we tinker around the edges and try to repeal a little bit here, try to do it here, there. Uh, meanwhile, you know, there are victims out there that are suffering as a result of this bill. Folks will say that we did this legislation without thinking through it. It was rushed through. Not, Not. another Not miseducation because this bill has come through the New York State Assembly for many different legislative sessions. There was no public inquiries into this though, but a lot of your, your former district attorney in Queens and other DAs around the five boroughs, uh, four boroughs were saying that they didn't feel that they were spoken to about it. What's your message to those in Albany right now? So I would like to just echo what the um, assembly members were saying. I, I do come from the assembly uh, from 25 years ago. I think they are an amazing uh, bunch of legislators and public servants who do care deeply for the communities which they represent. This was not rushed through. This was something that had been talked about for years. And the problem was that I think the frustration becomes very high when you see all of these lies that had been ruined by these low-level bail right. offenses. So, but there has to be a balance. And so I have great faith that the legislature is going to once again look at this issue uh, and that they will work on a compromise and figure out how to move forward. Um, so far, look, it has been a learning process for everyone, and legislators and uh, district attorneys that have been in office for 20 years yep. and those that are new. It is a new law across the state of New York. Uh, and so I think that we look forward to seeing how we uh, move forward. Other big things happening in Queens, which I want to <clears> get to, but I do want to just address critics real quick and get your thoughts on the fact that some people say you campaigned on the cashless bail yes. system. And you're saying to those critics, I'm not, that wasn't an empty campaign promise. No, I've reiterated that again and again. But I also think it's irresponsible 
uh, of the critics to say that that can happen in one day. Right. It is almost physically impossible, even if all supervised release were in place, even if we had enough mental health courts, even if we had the drug rehab necessary, even if we had all of the community violence uh, groups in place and vetted on day one, mm -hmm. it would be almost impossible to get there. Uh, it is something I believe in. It is something that I not only campaigned in, but I in my true heart of hearts believe that whether you should be on the streets is not dependent on how much money you have. Right. That is just an outrageous conclusion. But at the moment, uh, we are working with the state and the city to make sure that we do get supervised release in place and we work with what we have. My first job is to keep the people of Queens County safe. And so let's talk about this Conviction Integrity Unit, yes. CIU as it's known. Those <clears> exist <throat> elsewhere in the country. You know, um, nationwide, uh, the number jumps to 370 cases in the past 10 years that were overturned because of wrongful conviction, convictions. Here in New York in the past 10 years, it was 49 innocent people that had to have been exonerated. And this is something you're taking pride in. I want to show one story um, from our Shirley Chan about an individual who had his case overturned in Queens. This day has been a long, long time coming for all of us. The uh, motion to vacate the conviction is granted. A 30-year journey for justice finally came to an end. I just fought as hard as I could. Hugs and cheers filled a Queen's courtroom as Felipe Rodriguez heard the words he's been dreaming of for three decades. 27 of those years, he was in prison. Today, his 1990 second-degree murder conviction was tossed out. His record wiped clean. After court, he spoke with one station, PIX11. What kept you going three decades? I had a little boy. His picture was on my wall. I'm over here. I'm on cloud nine right now. Rodriguez was convicted in the 1987 murder of Maureen McNeil Fernandez, her body was found in a Long Island Railroad lot in Maspeth, Queens. There was never any physical evidence tying Rodriguez to the crime. He was convicted primarily based on the testimony of a man who had himself been a suspect in the crime initially. Today, prosecutors revealed key evidence that could have helped clear Rodriguez's name was never given to his attorneys during the investigation. It would have been a different trial. Rodriguez was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. Still, he kept fighting to clear his name. Attorneys for the Innocence Project picked up his case. And after years of gathering evidence, they convinced Governor Andrew Cuomo to step in, even before a judge issued his ruling this morning. Governor Cuomo commuted my sentence three years ago. But today, the change fell. All right, so obviously we see the importance of a unit like the CIU, right? We, we've talked about this a number of times. You got that audio? Um, we've talked about this a number of times in the morning news, talking about the Innocent Project and things like that, the work that they, they so do. So, Melinda, you're talking about having a CIU, bringing it uh, to a strong part of your office. How do you implement that and how do you follow through on that campaign promise? So we actually went to the Innocence Project and spoke with them and <clears throat> someone from the project is now on my staff and right. he will be head of the, of the uh, Conviction Integrity Unit. But as you see, there are people that are behind bars that have been insisting on their innocence for years. A lot of it you know, could be either DNA evidence or different types of evidence that they may not have been shown. Some of them simply just didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to have, especially after 28 years in one administration, remember I took over for someone who has been in for 28 yeah. years as the district attorney. And things have changed since the 80s and 90s and we are in a different type of world that we're living in where we want to give people a second chance where we want to make sure that only the innocent uh, only the guilty are behind bars and so the CIU unit is already active and working uh, we are working on a way to take in intake uh, of cases that we believe uh, may be still has uh, guilt, you know, innocent men behind bars and women behind bars mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that really whoever is in jail now really did the crime. How do you go about that? Because there were so many, you, you've also harkened back to the Central Park Five, for example, yeah. and the ideas of false, convection, uh, false confessions and uh, police tactics that went about in the wrong way. So how do you go about finding those and knowing that that's actually something you could overturn? So the first thing I did is to make sure that as I move forward, uh, that we have corroborating evidence mm -hmm. and that we make sure that we have the evidence we need in order to prosecute people. But we also have someone now who's head of this unit. We are working on a system in place. How, wh where do you start first? Do you start with the DNA evidence? Do you start with people that are doing longer than 10 years? Do you start with 
uh, attorneys who have made motions to vacate and have gone already to the courts. We are working on that now. Uh, I think right now we're already getting cases through our uh, system online, which is queensda.com, if any, uh, .org, if anybody would like to give us a case. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are looking forward to having those cases and really making it a very effective unit. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with, with working with the community, right? Because yes. you're hearing the community's concerns, um, hearing what they think is important to them, and that's why you now have a community partnership division. Did that exist prior to you? And if it didn't, why did you feel it was necessary? And what do they do? So, so as borough president, as you may know, I worked a lot with the community. We sealed convictions. Mm -hmm. We um, made sure that we had war and forgiveness programs. But I was involved in a lot of the cure violence groups, the mentorship programs, the workforce development groups. As a district attorney, though, they don't have a partner in our county. And I think it's extremely important that we partner with all of these organizations. So there used to be a division named the Special Prosecutions Unit uh, Division. It is now called the Community Partnership Division. So what do they do? And it is a woman who has been in charge of uh, the Bureau of Queens County and Family Court. Her name is Colleen Babb. And she's going to have bureaus underneath her. We're going to be doing pre charge diversion programs to make sure that people don't have charges that don't need to have charges that follow them for the rest of their mm -hmm. lives. We're going to have diversion programs at the drug rehab. We're going to make sure that we get people who've done state time in state prisons come back down to our communities where they're from and talk in the junior high schools and in the high schools to make sure that young people know that there's a better choice and a better path. We're going to be working with cure violence groups, which I had been doing as the borough president, to make sure that we're partnering so that the first time young people especially don't see a district attorney is when we're coming after them. Mm -hmm. And so as much as I want to keep guns, especially now in Queens County, we're having an issue with gun violence, especially uh, as much as I want to keep guns out of the hands and stop the market by all of these programs, I do want it very clear. You bring guns into my borough, you traffic guns, we're coming after you, and you're not going to be able to do it in Queens County. Um, we will handle the market, but we also want to make sure the supply is not there. Yeah, I'm reading everybody's comments right now that are coming in, and people are very fired up about the issues of bail reform, so do you mind yeah. if we go back to that for a second? Sure. Some people are saying they just felt that overall, that even though the legislators are saying they spent the time on it, and you agree with that, that it was rushed through, and that they feel like this is going to harken back to a time in the 80s where the city wasn't ready for high crime. Yeah, I think that, look, I understand people's fear in it. And we're getting cases now where we have to decide what to do. Um, you know, we just had a case where a man slashed a woman in the face uh, while the baby was sleeping mm -hmm. right next to her was the father of the child. And we had to figure out, you know, do we do a really high bail or do we remand? And I decided to do a motion to remand. Can you I, do that now under bail reform? You can on violent crimes. On, on violent most crimes. violent crimes, you can ask for bail. Um, I do think that supervised release and different organizational supports that we are going to have will help. But, but in general, I'm sorry to interrupt. But something like a second degree uh, involuntary manslaughter, right? That's a violent crime. Somebody died. Yes. But under involuntary manslaughter, they can be released back in under no bail. I mean, there are circumstances, I assume. But at the end of the day, uh, we still use bail right now because there's not a lot of alternatives or choices. And I think that is part of this problem, right? We have this. Uh, ability to do supervised release, the ability to put them into programs, the ability, but it's just not there and we don't have the supply. And so I think we need to let the legislature do what they do and the amendments I assume will follow and we will see what happens. But right now in Queens County, we are doing everything we can to keep it safe to make sure that if we have to use bail, we will use it, but get to a cashless system. Some folks are worried about subway crime and the fact that subway crime is going up. Now, I know a lot of it has been underground, but yeah. Queens has a lot of uh, uh, elevated subway tracks. Um, are you worried at all about subway crime and the policing of adding adding more police to the subways will help? I'm always worried about subway crime. You're in a contained atmosphere. You can't get away. A lot of times when it's busy, uh, you can't move within the car, nevertheless mm -hmm. get out of the car. So I am very concerned about that. And in Queens County, we had a shooting, as you know, last year uh, on the subway platform yep. where someone was shot right there on the platform. Uh, we've had uh, some crimes since then in the subways. But I think it is a very unique crime where you really can't go anywhere. And so we do need to focus on it. Um, I know, we're out of time. I know you have a lot that you wanted to talk about today, but I think this was a good start. We're going to have you back. Anytime. Um, and I appreciate everybody's comments. Everybody was very fired up about this one. So you have a lot of your residents in Queens oh. who are, are interested about what you're about to be doing. Um, this is... Uh, I, think, I think residents need to know that my first priority is keeping the borough safe. But I do believe that keeping it safe also means lowering the crime rate and working with our young people. Was this a good uh, changing of the guard, I guess, you, if you will? 28 years Richard Brown was there. The transition went smoothly, I think. I think people are excited inside yeah. the office. I think the community groups that we work with are also equally as mm -hmm. charged up about the future of the borough. 
Uh, and so uh, we are working and we're, we're out there on day one. There you go. Melinda Katz, thank you for joining us. Episode three of Inside Justice. And as always, I will continue to read your comments, comment on them. If you share this video and you have more people to join the conversation, urge them to join the conversation. Melinda, I'm sure I'll be reading your comments as well. And what was the website again? People can find out more information. Queensda.org. Queensda.org. All right, everybody, have a good day and we'll see you back on the morning news.